Mr. Speaker, I'm pleased to enter into debate on third reading on Bill 26, the Constitutional Referendum Amendment Act. Let me begin with some uh, historical context. Mr. Speaker, uh, in the earlier part of the last century, in the 1920s, during the progressive period in the government of the United Farmers of Alberta in this place, uh, Alberta went through a dramatic series of democratic reforms, including the adoption of uh, referendum legislation that allowed governments uh, to initiate referenda, as well as citizens to initiate referenda, and indeed to allow citizens to recall MPs to force by-elections if their re local representatives have lost uh, the confidence of a critical number of their constituents. Uh, however, over the ensuing decades, it, these reforms were all uh, gradually repealed. Uh, the reforms stay, many of these reforms stayed on the books in other Western provinces and, and U.S. states that had similarly been influenced by uh, the then movement of uh, progressive prairie populism. And in recent decades, there has been a renewal of this uh, spirit of democratic reform. Uh, for example, it was a new Democrat government in British Columbia, which uh, circa 1992 uh, re-established the right of citizen-initiated referenda, government-initiated referenda, and the right of recall through the British Columbia Recall and Initiative Act. Saskatchewan, circa 1991, under a progressive conservative government, adopted similar measures which, have, which were subsequently retained by NDP governments. Um, and so uh, this bill, Mr. Speaker, represents a, a part of a very deliberate effort by this government to renew that tradition of democratic decision making, uh, of, of which, which there has been an abeyance for far too long in our province. Mr. Speaker, in the uh, circa 1990, uh, members may recall there was great uh, contention over a series of proposed constitutional amendments. Uh, incarnated in the uh, Meech Lake Accord and later the Charlottetown Accord. And members may recall that Albertans were deeply frustrated with uh, what appeared to be a federal constitutional agenda uh, overwhelmingly preoccupied with the constitutional aspirations of Quebec as opposed to the West in general or Alberta in particular. In response to that frustration, the then uh, government of Premier Don Getty uh, responded by bringing forward the Constitutional Referendum Amendment Act. Uh, or excuse me, the Constitutional Referendum Act, I should say, uh, which imposed an obligation on the Lieutenant Governor, Lieutenant Governor and Council, i.e. the government, to submit to Albertans, uh, through, through the form of a referendum, any proposed a constitutional amendment to the Constitution of Canada. Uh, and this was to give Albertans the final say on whatever the Alberta government negotiated with the other provinces, territories, and the Dominion government with respect to prospective amendments to the uh, national constitution. Um, that act has never actually been used. Of course, there was a subsequent national plebiscite in the Charlottetown Accord, but held under federal law. So, Mr. Speaker, that was the basis of the uh, statute which we seek to amend in this place tonight, the Constitutional Referendum Act. It was essentially a response to the deep frustration in Alberta about the constitutional agenda of the late 1980s, early 1990s. Um, however, following the repeal of the uh, Referendum Act, I believe in the 1950s under the Social Credit Government, Alberta has not had a, a, a law, a statutory mechanism to govern a broad democratic consultation of the people through a referendum. We've had many referenda in our past. It's odd, Mr. Speaker. You normally, I, I've been on the uh, side of the official opposition. I was leader of the opposition in this place. I served in the official opposition in the federal parliament for, uh, I think, uh, uh, nearly a decade. And, and normally when I would intervene on a debate of this matter, I would begin by studying the relevant history and yet, in all of the debate, I haven't heard a single reference to the history of direct democracy in Alberta from the opposition. I think maybe that's because the NDP has always been opposed to direct democracy as a reflexive ideological position. Because what they were called, Mr. Speaker, they call themselves the New Democratic Party. But they're actually against the purest form of democratic expression, which is direct democracy. Because their idea of democracy, it's actually a complete contrivance. It's a complete play on words. What they mean by democracy is the state 
using its coercive power to confiscate people's property and then to redistribute it. That's what they call democracy. But Mr. Speaker, the real meaning of democracy from the Greek root demos, cross, 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 means, means to the people govern, the government of the people. And there is no pure form of government of or by the people than referenda. And we have had referenda in this province in the past, Mr. Speaker, on a number of issues. Uh, I think most recently, 1956, if I'm not mistaken, on, on uh, uh, daylight savings time, for example. We, we, we subsequently, as I earlier mentioned, did have a, a national referendum in Alberta. It was in 1991, 92 on the Charlottetown Accord. So referendum, this, it's not exactly as though we've been overdosing on direct democracy in, the, in this country or in this province, Mr. Speaker. We, we seem to have one about on average every 15 or 20 years. But referenda have, are, are um, you know, referenda are the most common, uh, one of the most common tools of democratic decision making. The very earliest form of classical democracy in Athenian Greece, uh, refer the, the polis, the people, would come together and vote on matters of public importance through referenda. In many jurisdictions around the world, of many different political and constitutional traditions, referenda are a mainstay of democratic decision making. For example, in Switzerland, one of the um, arguably best governed and most prosperous countries on the face of, of the earth, the, uh, the local Swiss states hold referenda very frequently. South of the border, Mr. Speaker, many U.S. states have both government and citizen-initiated referenda on the ballot uh, every time voters go to the polls. Uh, Mr. Speaker, just in Canada in recent history, we had British Columbia, Prince Edward Island, um, Ontario, and other jurisdictions have had referendums on whether fundamentally to change their electoral systems from first past the post to some form of proportional representation. Indeed, it was a, you know, one of the differences between the um, hard left that runs Alberta's NDP and the mainstream New Democrats in other provinces is that while this Alberta NDP is reflexively, they have a reactionary opposition to democratic decision-making by the people, their, uh, their counterparts in British Columbia don't share that ideological hostility to popular decision-making. I know why the NDP in Alberta feels that way, because they know the, the vast majority of Albertans are common-sense conservatives, Mr. Speaker. So they, they dare not give power to the people to decide in a province such as Alberta. But in British Columbia, politics is a little more nuanced, a little more complex. The NDP there held a referendum, Mr. Speaker, on proportional representation. They had the confidence to let the people decide. People, by the way, Mr. Speaker, chose to retain for the second time in British Columbia first past the post. Here's the point. Referenda are not new to Canadian politics on some of the most important issues in our history. Uh, for example, on the question of uh, conscription during the Second World War. A very hugely important national vote was held on conscription. And so this is deeply embedded in our history. I, I just heard a member say that, that this is an attack on our democratic institutions. No, Mr. Speaker, it, direct democracy, including referenda, including referenda initiated by government, is uh, indelibly a part of our political history. Our mother parliament, the Westminster Parliament in uh, the United Kingdom, has of course referred to the people uh, a decision, direct democratic decisions through referenda on, on uniquely important matters. Uh, 1973, I believe, the joining of the European, com uh, the, the, uh, European Commission, which later became the European Union. And then uh, in 2016, the referendum on leaving the European Union. So uh, it, it, in other Westminster parliamentary democracies, Australia and New Zealand, Referenda, again, are frequently used as the ultimate form of democratic decision-making. So uh, that is what, what Alberta, in this sense, is, is actually an aberration. We are an outlier when it comes to democratic systems around the world in not having a legal mechanism for referenda for the people to make the ultimate decision on important matters. And that is why we have brought forward Bill 26, the Constitutional Referendum Amendment Act, which takes that law I mentioned earlier, which the Getty 
uh, government proposed and was adopted by this assembly to allow for re to require referenda on prospective constitutional amendments and essentially what this does is to broaden that to allow for referendums of a non-constitutional uh, nature so what does that mean i know to some people this may all sound like just legalese let me break it down mr speaker this government was elected on a commitment to hold a refer uh, prospective referendum on amending section 36 of the constitution which is the principle of equalization a, a commitment that was recently reinforced by recommendation of the fair deal panel following extensive consultations with albertans uh, and that referendum because it would be framed as a potential amendment to the Constitution would be held under the status quo anti uh, 19, circa 1990 uh, what is it, 2000, year 2000, okay, that was amended then, the Constitutional uh, Referendum Act. Similarly, we committed in our platform uh, to hold a referendum in October 2021 concurrent with the next municipal election on the constitutional entrenchment of property rights. That again would be a constitutional amendment uh, facilitated by the, the 2000 Constitutional Amendment Act. But Mr. Speaker, there may be other issues where in the wisdom of this, this chamber or, or, the, or the Lieutenant Governor and Council, namely the, the elected, duly elected government, we may want to consult with Albertans. Um, I see my colleague, um, the Minister of Service Alberta, has been consulting Albertans on daylight savings time. That's something that affects absolutely everything. It's something on which our government does not have a, a democratic mandate to act. We've had, I think, two referendums in Alberta history on daylight savings. And so this may be an issue where we want to go to the people. And, and, and right now we do not have the legal means to do so. The NDP, in their reactionary opposition to pure democracy, doesn't want to allow us to go to the people on daylight savings, but we may decide it's the appropriate thing to do. This bill gives us the power to do so. Similarly, uh, Mr. Speaker, um, there, there, there are a number of issues. Uh, the, the Fair Deal Panel has recommended that the government implement an Alberta pension plan like Quebec has had for 60 years. Now, I know the NDP is, is, is absolutely reflexively against this. They believe Quebecers are capable of managing uh, our public pension system. They believe that Justin Trudeau and Bay Street can manage Alberta pensions, but they don't believe Albertans can manage our own pensions. Now, there, may, there are good arguments, uh, there, are, there are valid arguments for and against that, Mr. Speaker, that deserve serious scrutiny. And, and I uh, absolutely grant that there are, are strongly held and valid views for and against that proposition. Our view is that ultimately that decision should be made not by the NDP or by Justin Trudeau, but by the people of Alberta, Mr. Speaker. And the only way that we could have a legal mechanism to hold such a referendum is by, through the adoption of Bill 26. Now, the NDP says that actually all this is about is the Premier trying to uh, impose his agenda on Albertans in an anti-democratic power grab. Uh, Mr. Speaker, maybe it's... I, I don't know. I... That is a, a classic NDP through the looking glass parallel universe of, of, of total irrational illogic. Mr. Speaker, what this bill seeks to do is to disempower the government and to empower the people. It's to take power from the government to make decisions and to entrust that power to every adult Albertan, 3.7, 3.8 million Albertans over the age of 18, every one of whom could exercise their universal franchise to make decisions referred to them by the government. No, but that's not the NDP's idea of democracy. Their idea is only the cabinet should decide, or at most, only the 87 people in this chamber. And on most matters, that's how our Westminster democracy works. But on certain matters, particularly where the government may not have a mandate, it's not only appropriate, but I think uh, obligatory in a, in a democratic sense for the government to go to the people. And that's what this bill permits us to do. Now, they, 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 they whinge, Mr. Speaker, that this is, oh, they're, they're, they're the premier and the cabinet are going to decide what the referendum questions are. Well, um, I, I, I want to issue, Mr. Speaker, a trigger warning. I want to issue a trigger warning. <laughs> they're, they're welcome to leave the chamber lest they be offended because I'm about to say something that is, that is probably difficult for socialist ears to hear. Mr. Speaker, we will be bringing forward legislation this fall.
to introduce citizen-initiated referendum legislation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We will. And we have a committee of the legislature studying that right now. Now they say, oh, the Premier wants to write all the, 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 the referendum questions. Under the NDP, there never were any referendum questions. They never trusted the people. Mr. Speaker, we all know they were an accidental government that won that 2015 election because of a lucky vote split. They will never, ever, ever get a majority of the vote in this province, and they know they could never win a referendum on anything in this province, which is why they're against these things. But citizen-initiated referendum, Mr. Speaker, that allows the people to write the question, the people to determine what will be put on a ballot for pure democratic decision-making through referendum. We had this in Alberta. I think, well, between the late 20s and, and again, I think it was repealed in 1956, we had a citizen-initiated referendum law. They have a citizen-initiated referendum law on the books in Saskatchewan. I, I don't believe it's ever been used. Um, and they have a citizens-initiated referendum law next door in British Columbia, retained by the mainstream New Democrats over there who are much more confident about democracy than the Alberta and left. Mr. Speaker, in British Columbia, the people used the citizen-initiated referendum law uh, a few years ago when there was an effort by then Liberal government to harmonize their provincial sales tax with the GST into an HST. And there was a bit of a democratic uprising. And the then Liberal government arguably was not listening to their own voters or the people of British Columbia. And so people went around and they collected tens of thousands of signatures, they triggered a referendum, and they won that referendum vote, Mr. Speaker. They, they stopped, they repealed the harmonization of the PST with the, B, with the GST in British Columbia. Heaven forbid democracy broke out in BC. And the NDP there has not repealed the citizen initiative law. So when they say this is about the Premier Trump, no, Mr. Speaker, on some matters, the government, I'll give you an example, daylight savings time, potential um, uh, ownership of the uh, Alberta ownership of Alberta pension plan, uh, Alberta governance of the pension plan, and perhaps many other issues. The government may choose to consult the people, but we will also empower the people to force a consultation of the people. And I predict right now, the NDP will be against that too, Mr. Speaker. Just as they will be against, I predict it right now, our recall legislation. Well, I don't need to even need to predict it because there have been various private members' bills in this place over the past decades to bring in recall. They were all defeated. They were all defeated with, I got to admit it, you know, the Minister of Transportation is not here. <laughs> with, with the progressive conservative... Oh, I shouldn't say that. Excuse me. I take that back. I repeal. Uh, the, 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 the progressive conservatives and the New Democrats were in cahoots. Who the whip? To go against, <laughs> against recall, Mr. Speaker. The whip knows about that. So, um, Mr. Speaker, the NDP has created this dystopian picture that this bill is all about dark money in Alberta, bringing back dark money. The contrary is true, Mr. Speaker. In fact... Obviously, to have referendums, you need a legal framework, including for how money is spent. Now, you can't, a bunch of citizens can't run a pro or a, an anti side on a referendum vote for, for, for free. They got to get their message, they got to print brochures, maybe run some ads and get online and do some events. Uh, um, that's called democracy, and the bill imposes a spending limit on that. And I want to, I want to be very clear, Mr. Speaker, the uh, bill uh, before us says that all of this activity will be done in full compliance with the Elections Finance Contributions Disclosure Act. Uh, I, I cite section 7.1. For greater certainty, the Election Finances and Contributions Disclosure Act applies to every referendum held under this act, irrespective of whether the referendum is held in conjunction with a general election under the Election Act, separately on a date provided for uh, under Section 5B or in conjunction with the general elections under the Local Authorities Election Act. So, Mr. Speaker, the, the requirements for disclosure, the ban on corporate and union contributions, the limits on contributions, the limits on spending, they're all in here, Mr. Ma Madam Deputy Speaker. Um, and yet, we just, we just heard from a member from Edmonton she talked in, uh, repeatedly about how this was bringing, quotes, big money, dark money into politics, Take that, that the NDP had, no, had, had, had banned corporate and union contributions, so this thing seeks to bring them back. Mr. Speaker, Madam Deputy Speaker, pardon me, I, either that, the members who have spoken on the NDP have not bothered to read the bill, or perhaps their staff 
have completely misled them. I'll be charitable, and let's say it this way. Option B is their staff completely misled them about the contents of the bill. And option C is unthinkable, and it would be unparliamentary for me to assert that they actually have deliberately misled the chamber. I know that's not true, Mr. Speaker. Not. They would never purposefully mislead the chamber. So it must be that either they have not read the bill or they've been completely misbriefed on it. Because what the bill does is to retain the ban on corporate and union contributions that apply to general elections. And the bill, in the provision I just read, applies that to the financing of referendum campaigns. Madam, Spe Madam Deputy Speaker, that is not an opinion. That is not spin. That is not a line. That is the law in Section 7.1. And it is incumbent upon members, if they're going to vote on a bill, to at least have a modicum of, of, of accurate information about what it actually says, which in this case is to apply the ban on corporate and union donations to the conduct of referendum campaigns. Again, I just read the provision. If they, they, there's a bunch of New Democrats here. If they can find a provision that is not consistent with what I just asserted, it is their responsibility to raise that, but they won't. They won't because they can't. They can't because all they seek to do is to fear, is, is, to, is to drive fear, division, and disinformation into Alberta politics. While what we seek to do is to drive the refreshing air of democracy into Alberta politics through referendums, Madam Deputy Speaker. Now, they talked about um, <laughs> the member for Edmonton, so, yeah. said we, that this bill will, quote, bring democracy back to the dark ages. <laughs> Back to the dark ages. The dark ages. Well, I suppose if you imagine Periclean's Athens was in the dark ages, that, that, might, that might make some sense. Um, Mr. Speaker, Madam Deputy Speaker, what we're seeking to do is to give the people power to make decisions directly on important matters. How is that regressive? The NDP pretends that they are progressive, but they oppose democratic progress in this province. They think a tiny number of elected individuals or elites should make all of the decisions for the entire population and that the general population should never directly be consulted. Like I said before, they're not the new Democratic Party. They're the old autocratic party, Madam Deputy Speaker. They say, um, oh, by the way, I just have to rebut a couple of points. Edmonton South said the Premier never disclosed his leadership donors. That, that, Madam Deputy Speaker, that is untrue. And if it was said outside this House, it would actually be defamatory because it's an allegation that I broke the law. In fact, my leadership campaigns scrupulously complied with the Election Finance Disclosure Act. And indeed, uh, that includes a ban on corporate and union contributions. But, Madam Deputy Speaker, since they are so concerned about dark money, big money, in Alberta politics, they should be very pleased to know that a new day will dawn shortly, Madam De Deputy Speaker, when, when amendments are brought forward to the Election Finance and Disclosure Act, finally, finally to get big, dark money out of Alberta politics. I cite our platform on which we were elected. To strengthen democracy and accountability in Alberta, United Conservative Government will make sweeping democratic reforms, including removing big money from Alberta politics by imposing a $30,000 limit on donor contributions to political action committees, also known as third-party expenditures, and by closing the Alberta Federation of Labour loophole by prohibiting groups formally affiliated with political parties from running political action committees. I should further say, because the member, one of the members opposite spun a conspiracy theory that we're going to be bringing foreign money into, foreign dark money into leadership, uh, sorry, into referendum campaigns, <laughs> that Mr. Speaker, we further committed uh, in our platform uh, to ban, uh, uh, approve a law banning foreign money from interfering in Alberta politics, making it illegal for foreign entities to finance third-party advertisers, also known as political action committees. Isn't it rich? Isn't it ironic 
that the NDP would accuse this government of trying to open the door for foreign money to come into our politics when they refuse to close that door, Madam Deputy Speaker. And we all know why, because they want their allied green left billionaire foundations from the United States to continue to pummel the oil and gas workers of this province. We won't permit it. And this fall, we will make it illegal for the NDP's foreign friends to come in here and attack our energy industry by financing those campaigns. And we will make it illegal for their formal legal affiliate. The Alberta Federation of Labour, Madam Deputy Speaker, is a constitutional affiliate of the NDP. They have seats on the board. This Mr. McGowan, who recently uh, uh, accused, accused the elected government of Alberta of being a bunch of Nazis in trivializing the Holocaust. The very same Mr. McGowan sits on their governing board and he spent $1.8 million through a third party expenditure in legal terms when it clearly he was spending it by, for, and on behalf of the NDP. Mr. Speaker, we will close that loophole that has allowed political parties a back door to infect our money with our, our politics with big money. And Madam Deputy Speaker, over the past three years, NDP affiliated unions spent, get this, fasten your seatbelt, $4.8 million oh. on politics to support their NDP friends wow. and to attack the free, uh, the free enterprise parties in this province. Madam Deputy Speaker, one of them, I think the Health Sciences Unit, over $2 million, the ATA, uh, $1.9 million, if I'm not mistaken. Madam Deputy Speaker, how dare they stand up and talk about big money in Alberta politics when they and their friends are the biggest money we have ever seen? But Madam Deputy Speaker, I am pleased to inform the Socialists that this fall, the party is over. We are going to shut down the big money, the, bill, the millions of dollars, because there will be a $30,000 limit on how much donors can contribute to political action committees. And yes, Madam Speaker, that will include referendum campaigns. That will include referendum campaigns. So this Bill 26 is one important additional step in part of, as part of the most sweeping agenda of democratic reform in Alberta political history. It will be support, it is supported by Bill 25, the Senatorial Election Act. The NDP allowed the Senate Election Act to lapse. Why? Because they want Justin Trudeau picking who represents us in the upper house of our parliament. We Conservatives, instead, we want every Albertan deciding who represents us in the upper house of parliament. And that's why we'll be having Senate elections in the fall of next year. Again, the NDP against democracy, the government, this government for democracy. We will be bringing forward in this fall citizen-initiated referendum legislation. The NDP will vote against it, declaring their opposition to allowing voters to determine the most important issues. This government will bring it into law. The NDP against democracy, this government for democracy. This fall, we will bring in recall legislation, reinstituting it as it was repealed in the 1950s, giving an ultimate tool of accountability for Alberta voters. The NDP will vote against that democratic accountability. This government will bring in that ultimate democratic accountability. Mr. Speaker, in the fall, we will bring forward amendments to the Election Finance Disclosure Act, bringing big money out of Alberta politics by imposing a $30,000 limit on how much can be given to political action committees. The NDP will vote against that democratic reform. This government will, will vote in favour of getting that big money out of Alberta politics. This fall, we will bring forward an amendment to stop the AFL loophole, where the NDP gets to spend millions through the back, back door with their, through their Looney left ally Gil McGowan. They will vote against closing that loophole. This government will impose that loophole. Mr. Speaker, again, and it was this government that brought in a motion recognizing the right of members to vote freely on non-confidence matters in this House, something the NDP never did. They had members flee their caucus complaining about being bullied because they wouldn't vote in lockstep with the government on every single matter. Mr. Speaker, I am proud to stand here uh, as, as a leader of a government that is bringing in the most sweeping democratic reforms in Alberta history, and we will implement them regardless of opposition from the undemocratic and reactionary New Democratic Party. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, Jason.